Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liya salihin Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Khatam al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen Wa sallam ala abdika wa rasulika muhammad Wa ala alihi wa ashabi Wa man da'a bi da'watihi wa stanna bi sunnati Ila yawmiddin Wa sallam tasliman kathira Amma ba'd Is that reaching up there? Can you hear? Uh, uh, can everybody hear? Okay. Sisters, you're fine. <coughs> Louder. Okay. Just. All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous. And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners, and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant and his last messenger. And may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his family, to his companions, to all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows, my beloved brothers and sisters, to our innocent children, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And I want to bring uh, special salams from your brothers and sisters in the Cape region, uh, in the southern part uh, of Africa. And I, I want to bring also feelings of solidarity, especially in the Islamic school. Because Islamic education connected with the masjid as the basis of the community is one of the most important uh, elements of success today in the struggle that we have uh, to survive as Muslims in this world. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal would make this uh, masjid, this school successful and would um, increase in the number of the schools that are coming in this model. And may Allah bless the founder of the school his family, his friends, all those colleagues who have participated uh, in the effort of educating the youth and developing relevant Islamic education. And when I say relevant Islamic education, I speak about that which gives us the success in this life and in the hereafter. And that is the true contentment. That is the true success that we have closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal in this world and we have eternal life inshallah in the hereafter in the highest part of Jannah. And education has become so important. Knowledge, ilmun nafi'a, relevant knowledge is so important to the younger generation. Growing up in a world of contradictions and confusion. And the young people today who are coming into this world, who see Muslims in large numbers, who go to Mecca, who look at the Hajj, they can see it now on television. They see Muslims building large buildings, Burj Al Khalifa, largest building in the world. They see Muslims with the largest airports, some of the richest people, they go to the capitals and they see streets lined with gold. But at the same time, they will go to another part of the Muslim world and they will see poverty. They will see Muslims suffering under the gun. They will look at the situation in Gaza and they will see Muslims surrounded. And the world is not moving. It's a contradiction. And how to come to balance in the face of this contradiction, this is a great challenge for the younger generation, those who are coming into leadership. And so it is critical for us to try to analyze what is going on, to turn to our sources, to hold on to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal when we are in this uh, change that we are going through, and to never forget that for the true Muslim, 
It is a win-win situation. Either we win in this life or we win in the hereafter. And I again bring the example to you of the Muslims of the Cape who were taken away from their homes. In the 17th century, they were brought from uh, Java, from Malaysia, from parts of southern India, from the East African coastline. And they were taken by the Dutch into the Cape region. And they were made uh, slaves and they were political prisoners. And from amongst these people was a great scholar, Sheikh Yusuf from Makassar in Indonesia, who had resisted the Dutch colonial uh, presence for 20 years. And a deal was made and he left and he was taken to the Cape. And even though he was a political prisoner, he established a madrasa. He, he left a, 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 a chain of information or a chain of knowledge leading back to the Prophet Sallallahu And as I mentioned uh, in an earlier session, and I want to reflect upon this, especially in trying, that we are trying to seek ideas of contentment uh, in this world and in the hereafter. That in Surah to Yunus, verse 62 and 63, that the Cape Muslims in chains, getting up in the middle of the night, praying to their Lord, in a state of slavery, colonialism, apartheid, which separated people based on their color and their religion. They would constantly read, A'udhu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajim, Allah in the Awliya Allah, La Khawfun Alayhim, Walahum Yahzanun, Alladina Amanu, Wakanu Yatakun, Lahum al Bushra, Fil Hayatid Dunya, Wafil Akhira, La Tabdila Li Kalimatilla, Dalika Huwal Fawzul Adim. They would constantly read, Behold, verily, on the friends of Allah, there is no, nothing to fear, nor shall they grieve. They are those who believe and constantly guard against evil. For them are glad tidings in the life of this world and in the hereafter. There is no changing the words of Allah. For this is the great success. And so this divine revelation in the Arabic language gives us a key formula for success in this world and in the hereafter. In the awliya Allah, la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. And the scholars have shown us that this means there is nothing, la khawfun alayhim. They have nothing to fear in this world presently and they have nothing to fear in the future and they have nothing to be sad about nothing to grieve about for what has gone before and so this formula that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us showing us that this is a bushra it is a bushra because in it it is showing us that to be from the awliya of Allah, to be a person who is a friend of Allah, who is protected by Allah, who is given a special nourishment from the Creator, it is something that all of us can do. It is not a secret society. It is not something passed on by the blood. Allah said, Alladina amanu wa kanu yattaqun. Those who believe, and they have taqwa, al-khawf wa raja that they fear Allah Azza wa Jal, that they hope in the mercy of Allah Subhana, they surround themselves with the consciousness of Allah. And so they practice Islam not only in the masjid, outside of the masjid, not only around Muslim leaders and friends, but they practice their Islam even around non-Muslims. They practice their deen not only in Islamic programs, but when they are at work, when they are at school, when they are at the seaside, when they are in the mountain, anywhere they are. They realize that there is one who has divine knowledge. There is one who is closer to us than our juggler vein. 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows all that we do in the secret and in the open. And so with this consciousness of the Creator, they have nothing to be afraid of. And they have nothing to be sad about, that they suffered. Yes, we went through uh, uh, oppression, we lost the Khilafat in Turkey. We do not have a Khalifa. We lost power in this world. We lost our palaces. We had the beautiful uh, Andalusia. We had Cordoba and Granada. We had Baghdad, which was the most beautiful city on earth, with millions of books. But we have nothing to be sad about because all power and all authority rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we accept this, if we say, Qadr Allah wa ma sha'a fa'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He willed what will happen to this ummah, and whatever He wants, it will come to pass. And there is a reason for the pain. There is a reason for suffering. And I looked at the people living in the Cape. These people who had been taken from their homes, who had been made political prisoners. I visited Malaysia itself recently, and I saw the same faces of the people looking the same as my friends in Cape Town. But the desire for Islam that I found in Cape Town had even become more than it was in Malaysia itself. Because sometimes if you have Islam around you, you become lazy. You take it for granted. And when you are suffering, and when you are in pain, then you remember your Lord. And so there is a reason for the pain, there is a reason for the suffering, and there is a reason for everything that we are going through. Brothers and sisters, this world that we are living in today, to try to understand what is happening, to try to uh, make the connection with Allah, has become extremely difficult. And it needs for us to be highly intelligent. We need to go back to the Prophet ﷺ to give us keys to unlock the secrets of what is going on today. The Prophet ﷺ did not speak from himself. He spoke from above seven heavens. We live in a world today where people have the ability to make pictures, to make fantasies. They make something look real that is not real. They will take something false, make it real. Or they will take something real, and they make it false. So something that is happening on the ground, they will twist it around, turn it, that you cannot even believe what is going on to you at the place where you are. And the Prophet ﷺ said, authentic hadith, uh, reported in Al Jamia Sagheya of Imam Al Suyuti, Yakunu fi akhir al zaman dajjalun kadabun. Yatunakum fil ahadith bi ma lam tasma'u antum wa la aba'ukum. For iyakum wa iyahum la yudilunakum wa la yuftinunakum. The Prophet Sallallahu said, There will come near the end of time dajjalun kadabun. Great liars, to the point of being like false prophets, antichrists, they will come near the end of time. And they will come to you with a type of speech that neither you nor your parents have ever heard of before. Look at this wisdom that the Prophet ﷺ is saying. He said there was great liars who would come near the end of time and they will come with a type of speech that neither you nor your parents have ever heard of before. Beware of them. Beware that they take you astray. And beware that they put you into a fitna, a trial, a temptation. And Sadaqa Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, it has come to pass. Digital technology, where they can take images now, and they can put words in the mouth of a person that he didn't even say. They could take my picture and they could put words in my mouth that I didn't say, put it on a disc and send it to Al Jazeera or something like this and accuse me of something that I didn't even do. 
Our parents have never seen anything like this before. And we can even say those of us who are, who are over 30 years old or 40 years old, when we were growing up, we, we didn't even have these things. So it's even one generation, it's not even five generations, it's one generation that this technology has changed and they say it is changing so rapidly that by the month it is changing now. And so this is a new period of time. They will come to us with a type of speech that none of us have ever heard of before. Beware of them that they take you off the path. And beware that they put you into a trial, into a temptation, into a fitna. And so this requires on our part a high amount of intelligence. This requires on our part to be able to go back to our sources, to bring us to the straight path and to keep us out of the path of evil. Because evil today has become a business. And in many cases, the new uh, stars, the new idols that are coming out of the movies, many of them now are gangsters and bandits, criminals are the heroes for many of the younger generation. Evil has been made to seem like an enjoyable thing. And a person who wants to tell the truth, who wants to live modestly, who wants to judge people not based on their color, who wants to, 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 to live without interest and usury, that person feels strange. That person feels like they are an outsider in the world. And so it is crucial for us to make a connection with those things that are actually happening around us. And it requires for us to have a high amount of intelligence. In order to get this satisfaction in this world and in the hereafter, we need to have intelligence. The Prophet ﷺ gave us direction in this. And he told us in an authentic hadith, al kayis mandana nafsa. وَعَمِلَ لِمَا بَعْضَ الْمَوْتِ وَالْأَحْمَقْ مَنْ أَتْبَعَ نَفْسَهُ هَوَا وَتَمَنَّ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْأَمَانِ The Prophet ﷺ said, al kayis the intelligent person, is the one who controls himself. He controls himself and he works for the next life. And the ahmaq, the fool, the idiot, is the one who lets himself go does anything in this world, and then he hopes Allah will forgive him in the end. And so they give the shirts for the younger generation, and the Nike Air shirts, and you turn the back and it says, just do it. Just do it. What does that mean? Just do it. Do anything. This is the ahmaq. He lets himself, is how I go. He does anything, and then at the end he thinks, I will make istighfar, or that God will forgive me, I am a good person. And he lets himself go. This has been described by the Prophet ﷺ as a fool. al kayis mandana nafsa wa amila lima ba'd al The intelligent person is the one who controls himself in this world. He controls his desires. Because look at the life of this world. How long do we actually live in this world? How many years? The Prophet ﷺ basically said 63 years old he lived and he said in the 60s this is basically the lifespan of the Muslims in this ummah. If you live over 63 you're on borrowed time. This is the lifespan of this ummah. But let's give the person 100 years. Let's say that our man uh, Zaid, he lived to be 100 years old. <coughs> Measure the life of this world to the hereafter. And those who are studying math can try to do the math for me. You have 100 here, and then in the hereafter you have eternal life. 100 years and eternal life. Measure the two. Divide eternal life by 100 years. What is your answer? Zero. وَمَا الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعَ الْغُرُوَةِ The life of this world is nothing but deception. It is a deception. 
And if the person lived to be 60 years old, how much time did he actually have in this life? Most of us, if we sleep eight hours per night, okay, that's the average, there's 24 hours in the day, that means one third of your day you are sleeping. If you take it to your life, if you live to be 60 years old, that means 20 years you were sleeping. Think about that. You better invest in a good bed. 20 years of your life, you're sleeping. Only 40 years you're awake. This is mata al ghuro This is a deception. It's an illusion. So al kayis the intelligent person, is the one who work for the next life. He controls himself in this world. He provides for himself. She lives her life out, educates herself. But she realizes there is another life. Because when Allah describes the next world, He speaks about it saying, Khalidina fiha abadan. They will live in the next world forever. Forever. That is the intelligent person. So that person will put something away toward the next life. But the life of this world today, the evil one in control of much of the uh, facilities now coming at us, and I say this not that I am against television or the movies, it's a machine. But what is happening to it? It has been shown that in uh, San Francisco, a group of people uh, whose, whose leader was called Antoine Levy, in the 60s, they formed the Church of Satan. And they uh, dedicated themselves to the worship of the devil. And they made certain movies. They made uh, movies, um, Rosemary's Baby. And they made uh, a, a series of movies where evil became um, stronger than good. And they say that one of their greatest achievements was to make the evil one appear like he did not exist. Or that if he did exist, he's not a bad guy. He's just a little confused angel. He's a fallen angel and he's got a problem. Okay? This is their greatest achievement. But the reality is for Muslims, in order to be able to have the direction in this world, to make it through the life of this world, is like a minefield. It's like bombs going off all around us. How do we make it through this world? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 168 and 169. Telling us, giving us direction as to what is going on around us. What are some of the themes and issues happening? And Allah tells us, A'udhu billahi min shaytani rajeem Ya ayuha nas, kulu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba wa la tattabiyu khutuwat shaytan innahu lakum aduwun mubin innama ya'murukum bisu'i wal fahsha' wa an taqulu ala Allahi ma la ta'lamun Allah said, O oh mankind, humanity speaking to all people, Muslims and non-Muslims, eat of that which is lawful and wholesome from the earth and do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan for he is to you an open enemy he is an open enemy verily he commands you only with what is evil and sinful and to say against Allah that which you know not and so the shaitan comes with three things he comes and he commands us with su wal fahsha, with evil things, right? The bank robbers, the murderers, the gamblers, right? These are the heroes now. They make it seem beautiful and easy. And immorality, fornication and adultery made to seem like a normal thing that a human being is doing. Stealing and lying, cheating on his wife, it's a normal thing. Well, he's just, a, he's just a man. It becomes an easy thing for people to do. 
So evil and immorality, and third, you say about Allah that which you know not. And so people will try to say, they will tell you what God is saying. They will tell you uh, uh, things that even amongst us, even in the, in the, the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam, it has arisen people who will say things about Allah which Allah did not say about himself. They will say things about the Prophet Wasallam, which the Prophet Wasallam never said. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, مَنْ كَذِبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّعُ مَقَدُهُ مِنَ النَّارِ that whoever lies on me openly and he knows it will have a place in the fire waiting for him. And so, this world and the commands that are being given to us. How do we make it through this world? How do you make it through the minefield? We first have to know what is going on around us. To know what are the traps that are out there. One of the great scholars, uh, Imam Dar al Hijra, Imam Malik ibn Anas, an, when he spoke about sin, because remember the verse is saying that the shaitan commands you with evil, with sins, and with immorality, and to say about Allah that which you know not. So, what are some of the major sins? What should we look for? in order to make it through this world so that we will be satisfied, contented in this life and moving toward the hereafter. How can, what can we know? The Imam Rahimahullah, he said, Awul al-Ma'asi al-Kibar wal-Hasad wal-Shuh. Hasada Iblis wa Takabba. Faqala khalaqtani min naran wa khalaqtahu min teen. Faqala ta'ala fakula min haythu shi'tuma وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ شَجَرَةً فَشَحَّ آدَمْ حَتَّى أَكَلَ مِنْهَا Imam Malik Rahimahullah, he said that the first major sins, what were the first major sins that human beings were involved in? He said, pride, al-kibah, hasad, jealousy, and shuh, greed. Think of these three things, pride, jealousy, and greed. And think about the world today. Think about the capitalist system. Think about the inequality that is going on inside of the world. These are the first major sins. And still up until today, these are some of the greatest obstacles in front of us in gaining success in this life and the hereafter. So the Imam said, Rahimahullah, in explaining this, he said, Hasada Iblis, Iblis, he was <coughs> jealous of Adam. What a kabbar. He became proud. And he said to Allah, You created me from fire, and you created Adam from clay. So these are the first two. And then Allah said to Adam and his wife, The two of you eat from wherever you want, but do not approach the tree. Do not approach the tree and then they got greedy. Their desires came in and they ate from it. So these are the first three. Think about that. The evil one, the shaitan, he was uh, jealous of Adam alayhi salam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Adam the name of everything. He gave Adam a special position. And he told uh, the angels, Usjuju li Adam, fasajadu illa Iblis. He said, bow down to Adam. And the angels all bowed down. Iblis refused. And when he was asked why, he said, no, I'm made from fire. And he's made from clay. Why should I bow down? So you could say Iblis was the first racist. He was the first racist on earth. Why was he a racist? Because he refused to accept Adam. He's a fire man. Fire, uh, it, it goes, it moves, it's, it's powerful. You were made from teen, you're from clay. You fall down on the ground, you, you get headaches. You go up and you go down. I am jinni, I can move. So he's a racist. But he became jealous, hasad. Hasad came inside of his heart. And kibriya. Look at the world today. It is pride 
False pride that is separating people. False pride that is making it difficult for people to enjoy this world, to live together in peace. Proud of color, proud of language, proud of uh, uh, your passport, proud of these false things. When if we really look at ourselves, if you really look at your life, what am, what am I proud of? Shortly, all of us, we will have to go down on the ground. A beauty queen, a king, the most beautiful uh, person in the world. She, after a while, she becomes older, and then she passes away, and when they put her in the ground, nobody's going down there, even if she's Miss Universe. They will not go down with her. So what is she proud of? The richest person in the world. He has so much money, he doesn't know what to do with the money. But when he passes away, he can't take it with him. It stays on the earth. So the house that he built was actually not his house. That house was for his children or for the next people who will take over the country. The money that he spent is not really his money. The only thing he will have is his deeds. And so, why are we proud? What do we have to be proud about? We came from a humble place and we will return to a humble place. When we know this, when we realize how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to bring us in this world, and Allah has promised us that if we do righteous deeds, if we submit to Him, if we put our trust in Him, that we could live in happiness forever. Iman and taqwa. Remember, awliya Allah, alladhina amanu, so it is those who believe in Allah, they believe in the presence of their Creator, they believe there is a hereafter, there is something coming, and they have the consciousness of Allah. The second of the qualities, the hasad, the jealousy, envy of each other, envy of the material things, and looking at other people making progress and we feel bad about ourselves. When this happens, the person is denied happiness in this world. And it is said that one of the richest people who ever lived in the world, his name, he was an American man, his name was Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was so rich, he was unbelievably rich and everybody wanted to be like Howard Hughes. But he was so rich, the people wanted to get his money, he, enemies developed, he became paranoid, and they said at the end of his life, he lived in a room by himself. He was a hermit. He was paranoid of all people and he died by himself. One of the richest people who ever lived. It's fool's paradise. The person won the lottery in Canada one time. He won the lottery and they said he won about $20 million and the whole of Canada stood still. His daughter had the ticket. And everybody said, he's in paradise. He's in Jannah. But the man said, may God help us. He was intelligent. Then they started the call. They wanted his phone number. They wanted to marry his daughter. They wanted to live next to him. And he was so, he had to hide. He had to change his name and hide his identity. So the money which was supposed to give him paradise, it gave him hell on earth. So money, when it comes in large amounts like this, it is not necessarily something to be jealous about of people. It's not to be jealous about. I feel sorry for the brothers and sisters in the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam who are burdened with this money. They are burdened with so much money, they don't know what to do and there are people who are suffering. People who only don't even have one meal per day. And yet they are the same Muslims. And you are coming from the nation of a man. And it is said the Prophet ﷺ, when the gold poured into Medina. That he would not sleep until he gave away all of the gold. And then he went to sleep. Until he gave it away. And he asked Allah. He said I wa he wants to die with the poor people. He wants to be 
raised on the day of resurrection with the fuqara, with the poor. What is he talking about? He's talking about people who are not burdened with the life of this world. They don't give. Yes, there are those amongst his companions who fulfilled the trust of the money. And you look at uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhum, many of the companions were wealthy people, but they gave away their, their wealth in the path of Allah. And so the amana came to them, the wealth came to them, and they said, how can I give my zakat? How can I give my sadaqah? How can I uh, give my money fi sabilillah? And so there's nothing to be jealous about. You don't have to be jealous about anybody else. We said, look at the situation we have, what we look like, what we have, and say, Alhamdulillah. If you can say, Alhamdulillah, if you can be satisfied with what you have, then you have something that the richest person does not have. You are actually a king. If you can sleep at night, the person who has no bond, no mortgage, he has no payment of his credit cards. The tax man is not chasing him. His family is not angry with him. He's a leader and his, and his followers are satisfied with him. That person is a king. That is a king in this world. That is a person with contentment. Because the dunya is not controlling him. This is al -Kayis. That is the intelligent person. And so if we can be satisfied with what we have and give the responsibility, give from uh, what, we, what we have been given to other people, then inshallah we are making the test. Because the third quality that Imam Malik said, the first is kibba, the second is hasad, and the last is Sure, this is the desires and greed. And now we see what is happening in the world today, the greed. They are talking about the environment. A big conference happened in Copenhagen where they wanted to talk about the environment. It is turning against us now. We have polluted the seas. We have polluted the atmosphere. We have just cut down the, the rainforests. We have destroyed water all around us. Fish are dying by the millions. Animals are becoming extinct. And some people even say, well, no, we didn't do anything. That's just the earth. But the reality is now, because of what we have done, the earth is turning against us. And so they had a large meeting in Copenhagen. They brought all the, 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 the gather, uh, uh, leaders together and they said, Hopenhagen. They said, this is Hopenhagen. But after the meeting, they said, Nopenhagen. <laughs> There's no hope. Why is there no hope? Because what came out of this conference is that 14% is that 10% of the Earth's population is eating 86% of the natural resources. 10% of people, they eat 86, it's 80, uh, 86%. And 90% of the people, they only uh, eat 14%. So a tiny minority of people, they are controlling the wealth in this world. And they are creating inequalities in the world, and the people are forced to cut the trees down, to, you know, to make charcoal and to wood and to do all types of strange things and then we change the atmosphere, carbon dioxide uh, comes in and the atmosphere changes. And so the, the issue that people could not agree upon, it was not necessarily uh, that we do something to make the earth greener, but the, but the issue that could not be agreed upon is that the poor people in the world the majority of the people in the world, they deserve to have an equal amount of access 
to the natural resources on the face of the planet Earth. This could not be agreed upon. And because they could not agree upon the dist equal distribution of wealth, then the conference failed. And so Copenhagen, which the people were hoping to have Copenhagen, then finally became Nopenhagen, and there was no hope for the people at the end. And so the awliya of Allah, those are the ones who have satisfaction. Those are the ones who have contentment. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. They have nothing to be afraid of and nothing to be sad about and grieve in the life of this world. Who are they? الذين آمنوا وكانوا يتقون. They believe and they have taqwa. <clears throat> and taqwa is made up of al khawf wal raja. It is made up of hope, of, 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 of fear and hope. There's two things in taqwa. It's the consciousness of Allah. Now think about these two things. There is fear of Allah's punishment and there is hope in the mercy of Allah. And both of these elements make up taqwa. And some people even said, one scholar, they debated the issue and they say, which one is more important? Is khawf more important or is raja? Which is the most important of taqwa? And another great scholar, Ibn Qudam al-Maqdasi, he answered the question and he said, it's like saying, um, what's the difference between khubs and ma? What's the difference between bread and water? Which one is more important? If you look at the two, bread satisfies a hungry person and water satisfies a thirsty person. So both of them are important depending upon whether you're hungry or whether you're thirsty. If you are thirsty, you don't want bread. The bread will make you more thirsty. You want water. But if you are starving, you want something solid. So you want the bread. And so they looked at, at, at the boat, they looked at it. Which one of these elements? And different opinions came up, interesting discussion comes up about these two qualities. This is what we are balancing now in this world. And to a certain extent, we need them both. But the scholars said that in the time of Masya, if the sins have become the greatest issue, then the important part of taqwa is khawf. It is fear. That you need to fear the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to be conscious that for every action, there's a reaction. If you do evil things, evil will come back to you. It will come back to you either in this life or it will come in the next life. And Masya today has become the order of the day. Just as we saw what the shaitan will do, he will command us to do evil and immorality and to say against Allah that which we know not. And Sadaq Allah al it has become a, a system of a, a miseducation coming through the television and the media. A system of miseducation for the younger children, starting with cartoons. It starts with the children's cartoons. Do not allow the children to sit and watch cartoons without, being, uh, without you checking it out. Because through these cartoons, they can make a story which is, which is even worse than the movie. Because they create a being and, and they put racism in that. They will put hatred of women. They will put class consciousness, rich over the poor. They will give all types of message to the children that by the time that child grows up, that child already has a hatred of himself. He's ashamed of his family. He's ashamed of his language. He's ashamed of his nation. He doesn't want to be himself. He wants to be something which is not real. And so, in the time of Masya, the scholars say, then the khawf is necessary. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Bayyina has told us very clearly 
and speaking about those who are successful, those believers, in describing them, he said, Radiallahu anhum, wa radu an, thalika liman khashi arabba. That Allah is pleased with, with them. Allah will be pleased with them. Those believers who will get khayr al bariya, that they will have the best place to live, they will be in Jannah. Allah is pleased with them and they will be pleased with Allah. Who is this for? ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ خَشِيَ Rabba. That is for the one who fears his Lord. That he is aware of the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is most merciful, but at the same time that Allah is severe in punishment. And that is important for us to realize. And it does not mean that if we have done something wrong in this world, that we are destined for hellfire, Allah is most merciful. And Allah tells us in the Quran, Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'an. Allah forgives all sins. In this life, before death, Allah will forgive, inshallah, any sin that you do. But it means tawbah to nasuha, that you have to have a true repentance. To be satisfied, to gain contentment. We all make mistakes. But if we make a mistake, we need to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to make tawbah. And when we make tawbah, it doesn't mean you just say astaghfirullah. It means you recognize what you did wrong, that you turn, repent to Allah azza wa jal, and that you make the intention never to return to the sin. You make a strong intention. And then you do compensation. Part of toba is radd al madhalim. That means you give back what happened with the people. And some person will say, okay, if I stole uh, $1,000 from the store and I make toba, then I can give back $1,000. Yes, you should give it back. I don't say to you, take the money and go to the shopkeeper and say, I stole the hundred dollars from your shop, because he's gonna call the police. But give it back to him some way, give it back. Make your tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the point is, if you scandalize somebody, if you backbite somebody, then what can be done? If you said something against another Muslim, we had an imam in Cape Town, he was an imam who was a strong leader and he had an Islamic school and he was a serious brother and they made this discotheque, they made this uh, nightclub which they called Dark Side and this is the one that had seven heavens, seven levels in it, okay? And the imam, he found out that some of his students were in Dark Side, Islamic school. So he was the kind of person, he takes, he, he changes things with his hands. So the Imam, he went down to Dockside, Saturday night, they're dancing around, take ecstasy, they're all high and stoned. It's three o'clock in the morning and they go over uh, to the food and they're dancing around and, and then they go to the restaurant, there's a little stall there, and then they say, is there halal food? They're dancing around at three in the morning, eyes are glazed. The Imam said, you know what the Imam did? He drove into dark side, he went into the middle of the dance floor and he grabbed his students and he pulled them out of the place. With his jubba on and his cap, he went right inside and he took his students out. Now, some people are driving by and they see the Imam going into dark side. A stock for the law, there it is. The Imam is going to dark side. And they go back to their people and they start to talk. There it is. I saw Imam Fulan Fulan in dark side. Then suddenly Imam commit adultery. Imam takes drugs. Imam does this. And the whole thing goes out of place. The question is, did you go to the Imam and ask him why he was at dark side? If you went to the Imam and you asked him, then you would find out, he would tell you, I was doing Nahi al Munkar. I was forbidding evil things at Darkseid. He's the hero of Darkseid. 
but you said he's a criminal. Now, the point is, you want to make Toba. You found out that the Imam was actually bringing the students up. You want to make Toba. How do you do this? You cannot pay the Imam money. You ruined his reputation. Now, the scholars say, in this case, you will have to say good things about the Imam. You will have to go around and say so much good about him until his reputation comes back. This is Radd al madalim This is the way you will compensate for the wrong that you did for that person. And so Toba has to be a complete action that the believers do and not something which is false. It is a complete program and we can even call it self-analysis and reconstruction. And so by having this, we will gain, inshallah, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be al kayis the intelligent person. La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. They have nothing to fear in this life. They are satisfied with who they are. They have nothing to be sad about the past. So we lived in racism, so we had slavery, so we have apartheid. Should I cry all night? No. I need to go forward. I need to go forward with no fear about what will happen in the time to come. And so we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give us this contentment in the life of this world, that Allah would purify our hearts, make us to be al kayis the intelligent person, and give us that success in this life and the hereafter. I leave you with these thoughts, and I ask Allah to have mercy on me and you. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.